the Ligatoons Podcast. And here's your host, Andrew Mortimer. Hello there. This is a very special episode of the Beluga Tunes podcast. So thank you very much for joining me for this. Uh, so yeah, I did mention in the, the previous episode, it was just a, a little three minute thing that I threw together, uh, that I'm working on a show called Chucky Chicken. And I am pleased to say I have managed to get an interview with the creator, Michael Cook. Uh, and not only that, because <laughs> it's been a long time since I've done a podcast, so uh, I, I have a new computer, and turns out things weren't set up the right way, um, and when I was trying to get the interview going, uh, I realised I wasn't going to be able to record it. So Michael very kindly took over. Uh, he recorded it from his computer, uh, so that's what you're going to see. I'm going to play the clip that he recorded for me. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Yeah, that that was a that was great because without that we wouldn't have had an episode. So yeah, uh, that's what you're about to see. Um, so yeah, I think that's really all I need to say. So let's get right to it. I guess uh, just like for the listeners of this podcast, just um, if they if they don't already know about. Uh, Chucky Chicken, uh, just tell us, tell us what what it's all about. Uh, well, Chucky Chicken is a animated series on YouTube. It is, um, it, it is a basically a cartoon that is inspired by the the classics of animation history. Um, that's where we, you know, draw a lot of our inspiration from. It's a unique ensemble of characters, you know, that we use, you know, their humor and antics. Uh, that some, you know that are something that almost everyone can relate to. Uh, very much inspired by the golden age of animation, particu- particularly um, the, the mid-1930s and the 1990s is kind of where we draw our main inspiration. Um, but uh, Chucky Chicken is this uh, wonderful rooster, and um, he's got you know all of his barnyard friends. And it's kind of like, a, I, I hate to even compare it this way, but it's sort of like a modern day Looney Tunes where the characters can go and they can have adventures anywhere in the world. So, and they retell stories and it's really a, a fun time. So we're enjoying working with them for sure. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, because I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. It, it feels so good um, because I, I've, I've told you this before a few times, mm-hmm. but, but again, I have, I, my listeners might not know. Um, when, when I started Beluga Tunes, um, my uh, my vision was, you know, I was going to start a YouTube channel and I was going to come up with my own modern day Looney Tunes. Right. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, and it, it's one of those things where I, I haven't given up on that idea exactly because mm-hmm. I don't like I don't like to say, well, it's never going to happen. And I'm not going to bother with that anymore. Right. Um, but. When my friend Addy told me about Chucky Chicken, yes, I was intrigued. Um, and at first, I was like, "Well, I, I, I I'm not, not going to, uh, you know, you know I, I thought maybe there's a possibility they're going to say no because I, I don't know what the <laughs> what the criteria is right. uh, for this. Because I remember I, I just sent you a link to one of the, the channel the, the uh, videos that I put on my channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had no idea what you were going to think of it. Um, as but, long as you animated, that was what the deal was. So it needed to look good, and it did. So we're just like, okay, bring them on. <laughs> and I suppose that, that, that that's a sign that it paid off because um, the, the thing that I struggled with with, with Beluga Tunes the most is, um, yeah, I was doing most of the work myself. And I, I did kind of try to get other people involved, but I'm really shy and I'm not... I. I I was kind of afraid of asking other artists to get involved. No. Because I see so many artists, and they're, and they're so good at what they do that um, it, I find it a bit intimidating. Sure. <laughs> like, even when I look at your work, oh. it's just it, it blows my mind so much that I'm just like... <laughs> uh, you know, uh, thank you for saying that. I mean, I, I look at I look at my work and I cringe. Other people go, "Oh, it's amazing." I go, "No, it's not." But <laughs> but no, man. I you know that's that's how you start. You 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 have to you have to do it by yourself in order to number yeah. one attract the team that you want to work with, and then number two appreciate the team. 
because you yeah. you in the trenches you know um, how long it takes to write a script, then to storyboard that script, then to do character designs, turnarounds, facial expressions, um, background design, um, then all this pre work, you know, voice recording and everything that you need to do before you even sit down and start drawing. You need to do all that. And if you don't love every step of that process, it doesn't matter how good of a team you get. They're going to be completely lost. And they're just going to be like, why are we working for this person who hates this project and hates this process? Mm -hmm. You know? And yeah, I initially, I didn't want Chucky to be on YouTube. Like for me, my goal was initially uh, I wanted to put him on the Disney Channel. Like, I wanted him to be a television cartoon star, and this was back in, you know, the late aughts. Um, but, um, you know, right when YouTube was just starting out to be a, a thing. And um, it was very, very funny because I look back and I see everything that I've done alone up to this point. It literally means nothing compared to what we've been able to do together as a team. And... I really feel that when I first started to bring on folks like uh, Laura Van Galen and Imka Van Galen, and I also brought on, you know, guys like Esma Moreno to do the music and, you know, Zach uh, Arbogast to do voices. And, you know, when we did Grim Grinning Giblets, you know, plug, um, that was really the first time that I worked together with a big team of people. It wasn't the first time I worked with the team on Chucky Chicken, um, because even from the beginning, the very first Chucky Chicken cartoon was co-animated by uh, Coleman Surratt, who is this, uh, he was this amazing animator, he no longer is in the business, um, he's, he's not even in the industry, he doesn't even, I don't think he draws anymore, um, but um, when we were at the Art Institute, he got a really you know, he, he, he took a liking to Chucky back when he was black and white, back, you know, when he was a, a tribute to Up I Works and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and, like, the silent cartoons. Yeah. And he really liked it. He's like, you know, yeah, I'll help you animate it because I didn't know anything about Flash. I didn't know anything about computer animation. I just, you know, I knew what I saw on the behind-the-scenes features of Disney movies, you know, like drawing it on paper and then the big giant camera and the one, two, you know, the cells, <laughs> you know, that that's, that's all I knew what animation was and that's what I wanted to do. So now I'm, you know, I'm plunged into this world of, of computer animation and, uh, you know, Adobe Flash. That's what it was called when I got started. Now it's Adobe Animate. Um, and I had dabbled in, in Toon Boom a little bit when I was in high school, but not much, you know, to where I was super proficient in it. I mean, I did a, um, a my first animation I ever did was of Popeye the Sailor doing the Sailor's Hornpipe. And I'm so proud of it. I'm really mad because I didn't know how to export video back then. And I don't have it right. anymore. It's That was like maybe three. Yeah, I'll, no. I was just going to say because I, I would have loved to see that. I yeah. would love to see it too. But it's not, yeah. it's not in existence <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it's not in existence oh, anymore. No. But I mean that was like the first bit. And that was super duper crude. And uh, it's super sad. I could probably recreate it today. Maybe even better. Um, but yeah. um but yeah, that was my first ever animation that I ever did, and uh, I was really proud of it. And but then you know I get to college and I'm learning a whole new software with Flash, and I hated Flash. I hated that you couldn't you know do the lines as crisp as you wanted to, like it automatically like right. fixed itself. And I hated yeah. the limitations that Flash gave you. So having to work within those limitations. You think, okay, how can I do this? Okay, well, I gotta draw my drawings on paper, and then I have to ink them in felt pen, you know, like yeah. one of these bad boys, or microns, and then I gotta scan all of those drawings into the computer and then put them into Flash, and then that will get you the look that you want. But then the next step, you had to vectorize it and then you can go and you can color it. It just was a hassle yeah. and a half. So then, and I, this was yeah. before I had a, a tablet or anything. Um, so learning those limitations and having to work through those limitations and then having Coleman work with me 
Um, it was a challenge, but it was a great challenge. It was a very fun challenge. Um, we did two shorts together. We did Wake Up Call, which was the first, and then we did Chicken Fright, which was what Grim Grinning Giblets was supposed to be before Grim Grinning Giblets showed oh, up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, it was so funny because I look back and I go, oh, my God. If only I I was patient if I put in more work, you know, because I put a lot of work into that cartoon already, but I made a lot of sacrifices to try and, and make a deadline that I didn't even hit. <laughs> you know, story of my life, <laughs> making deadlines, never hitting them. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then uh, unfortunately Coleman, you know, and I parted ways and then I had to find a whole new team of people, which now I did. And then with Grim Grinning, it was taking what I learned with Coleman and then adapting it to what we're doing now, which is, you know, I'm I'm ridiculously proud of what we're doing with with um, with Chucky, and I think um, it's so fun to see the progression and the evolution of the character, and you know, see what I did years ago, and then compare it to what we're doing now. It's literally apples and bananas it it's completely it's like black and white night and day it's super cool to see so you gotta so long story short you gotta plow through the trenches by yourself and yeah, then yeah. yeah and then you can go okay i know how long it takes me personally to do a scene so i can teach somebody to do it this way or i can time yeah. them to see how long they can do it and i want to push them you know, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things you also got to consider. Like, can they draw your character? Can they animate? Do they have your technology? Do they have the same resources you do? If they don't, how can you get them those resources? But it's really a growing process. And what I love about this team is that number one, we we do, we're all learning together, which is amazing. Number two, we all are humble. Like, there's nobody who has like a inferiority complex who goes, "Oh, I'm the best anime." No, we're all on equal playing field we have some of the best people in the business teaching us how to do these cartoons which is super exciting for a lot of people uh, even myself like you know i we, yeah. we can talk about the people later but there's some people on the team that i talk to that i i even still get you know starstruck you know knowing that i'm like <laughs> and i'm talking with them absolutely yeah so yeah but you gotta go through it alone in order to appreciate when the people come and then you know how to properly like guide them and direct them and go, okay, you're not doing this right. Let me show you and then guide you in the way that you need to go. So, yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Um, and, and that actually got me thinking, cause I think when you were saying, uh, it, it, it's important to enjoy what you're doing. Uh, I, I have found a lot over the past few years, um, even though drawing is one of my favorite things like ever since i was a kid i'd love to draw um there are so many times where um uh, i've been trying to work on something and it just feels like a chore mm-hmm. and all i'm doing is drawing cartoon characters uh, that, that's supposed to be the thing that i'm good at it's supposed to be the thing that i love right and i've had so many times where i um i feel like you know, th- this this used to be fun, but for some reason right now I'm just not feeling that. Right. Uh, have you ever experienced that? Uh, oh. Is that? Do you think that's a common thing for? All the time, all the time. Uh, you know, there are, you know, there are mornings where you get up saying, "Okay, I have to do this because I have to get it done." And there are moments where, you know, you, you there, there are some days where you're like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get onto it. I mean, but then there are those days where you're just like, God, I'm working on this stupid scene. And if anything, it's frustrating because the, the process itself can be very tedium because as artists, we want it to be perfect the first time around, realizing that the first time around, you're never going to be perfect that helps alleviate a lot of the pressure off of you because it's like, okay, especially if you're working under somebody, because if you're working under somebody and they know your experience and they know like what they're dealing with, 
they'll be like, okay, let's see your first pass, and then they'll get an idea, and they'll go, okay, go back, fix this, this, and this, this. It can be heartbreaking. It can be really frustrating and really tired. But what keeps me going is the team. Obviously, boosting morale is huge. Um, And seeing the progress, you know, I like to have a couple of different versions of the file that I'm working on uh, at a time just so that way I can see for example what what I got done yesterday compared to the day before and if the progress you know goes from this to this to this I'm thrilled but if it goes from this to this to this you know (laughs) it can be frustrating um everybody experiences this though you know it's because as much as it's part of you know show business there's the show, and then there's the business, you know? And the business side can really be frustrating. I mean, that's the, you know, the repetitive, like, okay, you know, how many seconds is this, you know, action supposed to take? And, you know, why is the motion not looking the way that I want it to? Or, you know, how many times do I have to continue to ink this same way? Or, you know, the meticulous... One of the... Uh... Go ahead. One of the things I wrote down was um, when, when, sometimes I'll draw something because I, I know exactly what it has to look like in my head. Mm-hmm. I try to draw it and I just can't seem to get because I, I always find that with poses. And it, it's so weird how in, in my brain I'm like, I can see it. Mm-hmm. I know exactly what this guy needs to, how he needs to be standing and uh, the kind of pose that I want. And when I try to do it, I end up doing completely the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. And I think um, I, I've kind of just relied on dumb luck over the years <laughs> because uh, I'm just like, well, it never looks exactly like how I picture it. So I just have to kind of just uh, see where it, it leads me while I'm drawing you or something like that. Right. <laughs> well, the late, great Chuck Jones, uh, you know, learned when he was in art school that and he this was a philosophy he lived by. Every artist has 100,000 bad drawings in them. You have to get all those out of the way. So just keep drawing. Keep going, you know, because you will whittle away through those bad ones. And then pretty soon your artwork is going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, And in 33 years, I'm pretty sure I've done way more than 100,000 bad drawings. But they still suck. But, you know, it it is what it is. And I think... I suppose, yeah. Yeah. uh, It's not literally that number. Uh, but, it, but I think that's a good way of looking at it because yeah. uh, it makes you feel better about the ones that don't turn out the way you want them to. Oh, yeah. Because uh, it is just part of the process. And even looking back at like some of the early work, uh, like, as far back as even just last year, you know, when yeah. we were revamping the, the, the concept packet and looking at the drawings that were used in, the, in that packet compared to the drawings that we're making now, again, it's you're constantly leveling up. And you can look back and go, wow, that's where I was a year ago, and here's where I am now. And it was only a year. Like, you're going to continue to get better. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, I, oh, I I experience that quite a bit, especially with, you know, things like, um, you know, animatic, you know, animatics, um, animating, ink and painting, you know. But the, the, the high of animation really comes when you lay out the scene – you have the in-between starting to come together and you hit the play button and you see it move and you realize, holy crap, I did that. Then it just kind of like, okay, now it, it went from being something that I have to do just because, you know, it's, it's part of the job to I have to do it because I need to see it come to life. I need this to, to be better than anything that I've done before. And that, I think, you know, it's that initial, like, jump start, if you will. But if you have everything planned, and that's where planning and that's where, you know, organization and cooperation with the team just comes together. Because at that point, if you have a bad, you know, if you have a bad team, if you have bad organization, bad direction, of course it's going to be a hassle to get a cartoon done. But if you have a really great team, it's like, okay, here's how the character should look. Here's the scene. Here's how long it takes. Go. You know, it becomes fun. So, and again, working by yourself, 
I know that frustration because you have a set vision of how you want the cartoon yeah. to look, but sometimes your skills don't match your vision. So mm. what do you... I, I feel like uh, a lot of the time, though, it, it's good not to get too obsessed because I, I quite like to um, experiment. And like if I draw something that's in my head and it's not quite working out the way I wanted to, I then start to think, okay, I'll try and do it in a different way mm -hmm. and then start throw, you know, throwing around lots of different ideas. And then I think that's another way of... Because uh, you know, there's just infinite ways of doing the same drawing. Yeah. And it's funny because you find out that the thing in your head will never beat what's on paper because that's alive, you know, and then that can continue to be refined and be retweaked. And then what I discover is that sometimes what you think in your head, you know, you put it down on paper and you go, oh, that doesn't look good. But then you alter it and you go, oh, that looks way better. So yeah. it, it continually levels up and it becomes an even better vision than what you initially thought. And that's why I love animation, because you can come up with an idea in your head. I'll give you a perfect, a perfect example. When we were doing Grim Grinning Giblets, um, we needed to design Grayson Manor, you know, the haunted house. Mm -hmm. And I had a set idea in my head of what I wanted the mansion to look like. I because we were paying tribute to uh, the Disneyland Haunted Mansion, I wanted it to look like the one that we had at Disney. So I went to Imka Van Galen, who was the, the background artist for that project, and I said, look, we need the attraction, we need the, the exterior of the mansion and the interior of the mansion in our cartoon to look like the one from Disneyland. So if you can do that, you're golden. And she said, okay, that's no problem. Cool, cool, cool. And I said, cool. A couple days go by and she sends me this drawing of this old, you know, rundown mansion that looked nothing like the Disneyland version. Like my, you know, I'm thinking Disneyland, Southern California, you know, New Orleans Square, old Annabella Mansion, you know, pillars, you know, the whole nine yards. And she sends me like sort of a traditional Western looking haunted house, like kind of like a um, like a, a Munster uh, Adams family oh, yeah. looking kind of thing. And I went to Imka. I said, gee, that's not what I was thinking. Are you sure you were looking at uh, at the Disneyland version? And she said, yeah, this is what they had at Disneyland. And so this is what I was, you know, this is what I used. And I said, could you send me your reference material? And sure enough, she did. And sure enough, she was right. It wasn't my Disneyland she was looking at. It was Disneyland Paris. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to make a little confession here. Okay. That, that's that's the only Disneyland that I've been to. Right. I haven't, I haven't been to the proper one. <laughs> no, 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 no. And that was, that was the beautiful thing about it. I laughed and I said, oh, my God, this is perfect. It is different. Yeah. It, no, it's perfect because now there's international appeal. Because I know yeah. my Disneyland, and I know my Haunted Mansion, and then you guys in Europe have your Disneyland, and your <laughs> haunt over there, it's Phantom Manor. So, I mean, yeah. it, it's interior, like, it's they're both very different rides. Very similar, but very much different. And I said, yeah. you know what, we're going to go with that, because that is, that is the look... For Grace and Manor, it's creepy. It's perfect because there were so many... And I explained the story of how when they were designing the mansion in Disneyland, they went to Walt yeah. Disney and they said, do you want it to look creepy on the outside? Do you want it to look kind of ghoulish? And he said, no. And mm -hmm. he, he said, I want the grounds kept all t at all times. I want the house looking pristine, clean, because I don't want people to think that we don't care. Uh -huh. We don't take care of things at Disneyland. So we'll take care of the outside and let the ghosts yeah. take care of the inside. Well, That's really interesting. when they were building Paris, they decided to flip the script. And they said, you know what? If we do that in Paris, they're not going to know it's a haunted mansion. They are not gonna. Uh, they're not gonna put two and two together. So we <laughs> need to make it look because again, it's a culture difference. You know, in Fr in Europe, and yeah. in, in in you know, you guys have a different idea of ghosts and the supernatural than we do here in the states. While we think of happy, you know, you know, grim grinning ghosts that come out to socialize, over there, death is a more serious thing, especially in like other countries like Asia and you know, Europe and France and you know, all those you know. Anyway. 
Wow, I'm just really showing off my. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't know that. I, yeah, um, uh, I knew that um, the the castles are different because mm -hmm. in Paris it's the castle from Cinderella. Is that right? Uh, Sleeping Beauty, actually. Sleeping Beauty. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. In Disney World, it's Cinderella Castle, but the original Cinderella Castle, yeah. The original Disneyland is Sleeping Beauty as well. But yours, oh, okay, yeah, the original. Yeah. Again, you know, America is building a park in Europe, which is the land of castles. So how do you do a fantasy castle in the land of castles? Like you guys, you know, go down the block and like, oh, there's another castle here, another castle there. It's like you got them all over the place. <laughs> Where over in the <laughs> states, we maybe have like really two, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is Cinderella and Sleepy Beauty. That's it. And maybe a couple of medieval times here and there. But um, but other than that, so they had to really be creative and, and bring the whimsy and the fantasy to the, the Gothic architecture. And I, I've always wanted to visit Disneyland Paris. Like that's on my on my bucket list. And when I get to Europe, though, that's going to be one of the first places I go. Because um, I've heard it's the most beautiful of all the Disney theme parks in the world. And um, plus, you know... I, I, I went there one time, yeah, uh, just once with my family, and I I loved it. I, I went on all the rides. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so yeah, I I certainly I, I know I've I've heard some negative comments about it, but I I don't I can't really say if it's better or worse than the others because it's the only one that I've seen. Well, I, I I know that when they were opening the park, the French government did not want. It. Well, the French government was excited about it, but the people. Like, there were a lot of far-left communist people who were like, we don't want, you know, don't invade. All right. Yeah, you know. You know, there were picket, fi you know, picket lines with people going, Disney, go home, you know. Just like, yeah. oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Pelting eggs at Scrooge McDuck and um, <laughs> at Michael Eisner. So that was not a good thing. But, I mean, th that's kind of the, the point of, like, where I had one vision in my head of how I wanted the mansion to look. And then someone else came and gave me a completely different vision that was even better than what I had. That's why I love animation. It's such a collaborative process yeah. because you come up with one thing, then somebody else comes up with another thing, and you go, oh, my God, that's yeah. even better. Or sometimes you put it together. I suppose I have an interesting story of my own because uh, when, I, when I first joined the team, mm -hmm. um, I, I was drawing lots of pictures of Louis. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if, if I can't really think of you know, anything, anything off the top of my head, uh, usually I just go to just really random places. Like I, I drew a lot of random stuff thinking, I have no idea if we're ever going to make use of this. I'm just going to be random and weird. Because uh, I, I drew a picture of um, Louis dressed as a wizard, mm -hmm. um, and Chucky was holding an apple. It was an apple in the first drawing that I, I did. Um, and Louis was casting a magic spell on this apple, and he, he didn't notice, but he was making it turn into a, a, an evil apple with an evil face mm -hmm. on it. Um, and when I showed it to you, you said, hey, that's something that we could do for Halloween. And it's so weird because I, I actually wasn't thinking of Halloween at all. I was just being weird. <laughs> right. I, I, I had no intention of making it a Halloween thing because it was an apple. It wasn't a pumpkin. Right. Because we, we turned it into a pumpkin when we, we did the animation mm -hmm. for Halloween. Um, yeah, so um, I, I was like, yeah, that, that is a good idea. And it's so weird how it, I, I just thought of it as a random thing because... It was, it was. I think it was still summertime, so I wasn't thinking of Halloween. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became, uh, and that's the first video on the Chucky e. Chicken channel with my name in the credits. And rightfully so. And it's a. It was a great <laughs> cartoon. You know, it was a fun. And and that was when I knew you were going to be a huge part of the team because you took that idea and you. Oh. You weren't adamant, like, no, it's got to be an apple. You know, no, you can't use it. It's like you were like, okay, <laughs> See, cool. I've, I've learned not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the old me would say, no, we've got to make it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, me too, man. Like, I... I, I Apples are funnier. Funny, yes. Apples are funnier than pumpkins. What? <laughs> 
have you seen a pumpkin? <laughs> yeah. Like, when did you last yeah. laugh at an apple? You know, like, let's be real here. <laughs> Apples are healthy for you. Pumpkins make funny faces. Let's be real here. Yeah. Um, plus, they got the vines, you know. They can do the cool, which is another yeah. thing that we did with the, the, the vine lifting yeah. up the banner. And that cart it was just a little, yeah. yeah. No, that cartoon. doodle. That... Yeah evolved into a cartoon yeah and that was a great one for us because that was the first time where we started to color the lines in and that was when mm -hmm. we you know oh my god imka did such a magnificent backdrop for that one too that was just yeah like everything just like fell into place with uh zappo lantern that was a really great cartoon and even though it's very short at like 20 seconds or so it's still very powerful, and it, it gives you a good idea of what the series is in just a small clip, and um, mm -hmm. you know, just the the mayhem and the wackiness and the looniness and like the magic of it all. And that was just such a fun. That was such a fun cartoon. I really that was a lot of fun. It was. Yeah. So, and we need we're going to do more of those as well, which I'm looking forward to doing. So, all right, hit me with another one. What what else you got? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah, in the um, in the animated survival kit, there's a, a little section about working in silence, <laughs> and it says, you know, "Unplug, <laughs> uh, switch off your music, close the door. Uh, you got to concentrate on your work." And I, I was uh, uh, ever since I first read that, uh, I was like, I kind of think, think it's different. You know, for, for different artists. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because I used to listen to a lot of music and podcasts whenever I was doing drawing and animation. Um, although I will admit, uh, this year I tried really hard to avoid that, to just work in silence. Um, and I think it is, uh, it, it's having a good effect on my work. I think I am producing better work but i have heard people question this there are other artists like really good artists who say yeah it's not it's not the kind of thing that works for everyone some people need something like if it's too too quiet uh, that can be a problem to them mm -hmm. and i'd like to know your thoughts on that do you work in silence well um I don't, <laughs> um, but I mean, I'm no milled call, nor am I Richard Williams, and it shows. <laughs> no, um, I, I actually was very fortunate enough to go to school where we had uh, the Richard Williams masterclass on DVD. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I was taught by Richard vicariously through his, you know, his DVD you know, collection. Um, and uh, I, I do know that story very, very well. And Milt Call was, um, was a master at, uh, at animation. So I will take his word for it. If he says unplug, you damn well better unplug. <laughs> but I also think that that was really a product of the time because, you know, they didn't really have the technology that we do today, like they didn't have, you know, really good headphones. They didn't really have, I mean, if they were going to play music, they had to turn on the radio, you know, or they had to put on a, a record or, you know, later on in life, an A-track or a cassette tape or something, you know. Um, so I, I personally, I need something to help me stimulate and get excited about what I'm working on. Um, so, for example, if I'm working on a a jungle adventure, you know, I'll listen to jungle music. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what is jungle music? So I'll go and I'll put, you know, I'll look up, um, you know, if it's going to take place in Africa, I'll listen to African music. You know, I'll put in, That's a good idea. you know, or if I'm working in Asia, you know, I'll listen to, you know, if I'm listening to Southeast Asian music, if I'm working on a Southeast Asian project, it gets you in the mood for the kind of story that you're going to tell. If you're going to do a Western, you listen, American Western, you listen to cowboy music, you know, or Western music. Um, I think that helps. 
you know, putting you in the mood of, of you know, if I'm, lis- I'm going to do like a prehistoric adventure, I'll listen to like prehistoric music or what a facsimile, because we don't know what that would be, you know, and, and that'd be a lot of xylophones, a lot of, you know, bass drums, you know, because, you know, bones and things. Um, yeah. Which is ironic because they wouldn't have the bones because they became the bones, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, so it, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good idea. I don't have, I hadn't really thought about doing that. Yeah, that um, it makes sense. It's a double-edged sword, though, because sometimes you can get lost in the inspiration. Like I know that if I'm working on character designs, for example, and I'm listening to some of this music. You know, I'll I'll have like five or twenty characters created, but no animation done. It's like, oh crap. Okay, now I gotta really, or I'll listen to, um, if it's gonna be a fast paced animation, I listen to Carl Stalling or I listen to Looney Tunes music to really get me yeah. in the mood of what I'm working on. Um, so for Chucky, I listen to a lot of you know classic 1930s Disney type music. That helps a lot. Yeah. Um, it just so so. No, I don't listen to music. Uh, I mean, no, I don't listen. I don't not listen. I don't work in silence. That's what I was trying to say. I don't work in silence, but I use the music to my advantage, um, which I, I think helps tremendously. Because you can listen to to rock and roll or whatever you're into, and that you know that'll help you get through like you know the mundane stuff you know like the the inking and the painting and all that stuff but if you're really trying to be creative listen to music that inspire that's why you know i love world music i love all types of music from all over the world i love you know arabic lounge music i love irish drinking songs i love um you know uh german uh you know polka music i i mean scott you know bagpipes from scotland irish you know, uh, even, you know, English uh, tunes played out a harpsichord. It really, you know, which I, is, I don't know, you know, there's either harpsichord or Beatles. That's, you know, English music. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, <clears throat> um, but yeah, I mean, that, it, so it, by doing that, that really puts you in the, in the m- mental mood of where you're going to be in the cartoon. So that's that's what I do. Or if I'm like in Brazil, I'll listen to you know the samba, you know, dun 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 dun. dun. <laughs> exactly, you know. Yeah. So and and then not only that, but then that gives you an appreciation for different cultures and a different because music is, you know, the gateway to people's souls. You know that that really gives you a a perspective on their kind of life that they've lived in their history. You know, and I mean, I I think it's really cool to kind of listen to different types of music and really get appreciation for it and then it encourages to you know i'll I'll never forget when we were doing um we were designing the houses for the characters in featherton and we were doing chelsea's house and chelsea is a middle eastern hen so i was listening to some music uh you know from uh, you know, uh, I, I call it Arabic lounge mu- music, you know, like hookah bar music, which is very, very relaxing, by the way. And then looking at some of the architecture, you know, the beautiful, you know, um, you know, a lot of this is a lot of stuff from Morocco and from uh, Saudi Arabia and, you know, uh, all those Middle Eastern countries. And just researching it while also listening to the music and seeing the pictures of you know the the uh, the beautiful carvings and the mosaics that they did and all of the the beautiful you know the 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 the, the, the you know the, the the Arabic language that they have all over the um, the, the, the art you know their, their buildings a lot of the mosques a lot of the marketplaces it gives you an appreciation and a and a deeper connection to that particular place. And it makes you yeah. want to research it more and learn more about the place that you're drawing about. You know, I yeah. I, I wish I could take my artists and say, okay, we're going to go on a fact-finding mission, pack your bags, we're going to Morocco. Can't do that. <laughs> so thank God we have the internet, which is the next best thing, you know. Yeah. So, but yeah. And, and it is, because it, it's so important to do research, and I, I, I 
I think that is one thing that I I need to get better at. Mm -hmm. So maybe I I need a bit more music. (laughs) I think because I I can see that working. I I think um, I would probably be to put more care into my work because I'm very impatient. I think one of my biggest weaknesses is my impatience. Um, Like when when I'm drawing something, often I fall into the trap of jumping ahead Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll skip over a lot of the important stages that i need to go through you're not alone um, <laughs> you are not alone yeah. not alone at all as it's quite quite a long process mm-hmm. and there is that part of me that's like i just want to get it done i right. just want to finish it i want to see how it, how it looks <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you this because i have fallen privy to that trap many many times yeah. when you feel like you want to get it done that's when you need to slow down oh yeah yeah you know because if you rush it It'll look like garbage. Yeah. I look at some... And I can tell on my end, like the scenes that I rushed in some of the cartoons compared to the ones that, you know, we were just beginning and just really starting because the quality shifts. It goes from looking really, really good to, oh my God, what the hell happened? <laughs> you were, you know, you, you know, did you not sleep for three days? Which was the truth. Um, you know, but... The, but rushing to try and get something done, it's like you really – like that's never worked. You need to be like if you know you're just about finished, you get up, you walk, you, you get up, you, you, you move, you, you stretch, you get a cup of coffee, you step away from it for a little bit and you go, okay, I know I have a little bit more to do. I'm almost done, but I cannot rush it. I need to take my time on these last couple of frames or on these last couple of seconds because if I fail to do so the animation will falter and it's it's so imperative that right when you get into that last stretch unless it's something super easy that you can just click colors and go boom 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 you know if you're coloring in something but if you're inking or if you're drawing and you need to really you know get that steady hand and you need to really focus step away from it for a little bit that's so important and i i i say that because i have fallen for that trap a number of times on many of my shorts and they they fault and they look bad like i mean to me they look bad i can tell like i look at it and i go god i wish i wish i had just taken my time and just you know put in more frames here or really focused on the inking here and just really, you know, cut, you know, went back and fixed this part there. And, you know, maybe one day I'll do that, you know, but, um, I mean, but going forward, you slow down. So. Yeah. <laughs> Very good advice. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I've got on, in my notes is, uh, artistic envy. That's something that I, I've been very obsessed about. You noticed my wall, did you? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. You tell the listeners what you're pointing to. Oh, uh, I well, I recently purchased. Well, not recently, but last year, I got a a signed autograph picture from uh, Michael Kovach and his character of Angel Dust from Has Been Hotel, and he. Wrote it to both me and the chicken, which was really, really nice of him. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but anyway, go ahead, ask your question, and then <laughs> we'll go from there. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's generally just, uh, do, do you get envious a lot, and how do you cope with it? Like, how do you, what do you do? Because uh, it, it's just something that I, I've, I've noticed a lot, uh, especially just within the past few years. Mm-hmm. I just because I'm coming across so many artists and it, 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 it's something that um, it, it, it troubles me a bit whenever I see artists who are so good at what they do. Uh, I, I, I find it a bit deflating, mm-hmm. and yeah, because I, I do want to like be, be a fan of these people, but it's it's kind of hard when <laughs> I'm trying right. to do the same kind of thing. Right. Yeah. What do you? How do you feel about it? Is it like, <sighs> something that you? Oh, no, no, never. No. <laughs> <laughs> Me, jealous? What are you talking about? No, of course. I mean, you would not be an artist if you didn't get jealous of somebody because that's your fire. 
Okay. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's where um, yeah. that's where your big. You know, unfortunately for a lot of people, spite and jealousy is the best motivating factor to try and be yeah. better than somebody else. But um, I I've been jealous of quite a few artists. Um, Miss Madrano is one of them. I yeah. was very. Um, but then I, you know, for me, it's like, I was very jealous of her. I was jealous of the Cuphead people. I was jealous of the Bendy and the Ink Machine people, like anybody who did the 1930s style of animation and succeeded. I was very jealous and very bitter about, but then, um, I realized a couple of things, you know, number one. Where are they located? Uh, you know, it doesn't matter where you're located, but it's it's what you do with what you got. They folk, they put all their cards in. You know, they put all their cards into their projects. They put all their money into their projects. They put everything that they owned, their lives, into what they were doing. At the time, I was not. I was doing the nine to five jobs i was doing the the grocery jobs the delivery jobs you know the mundane you know work you know work to live jobs you know and i would go home and i would be exhausted and i wouldn't you know and and i would work on the car you know i wasn't putting in the work you know if you don't put in the work as my uncle Rob, love you know, lovely you know, lovely says, if you don't put in the work, you're not going to get the results that you want, you know. So that's number one. Number two, their resources are completely different from your resources. You know, Vivian Madrano was based out of New York. She went to the New York School of Design. She was in the right place. Um, yeah. She had the right inspiration. She had the right contacts. She ended up, you know, she hustled like crazy. She got a job at DreamWorks and she was able to work on a lot of different projects under DreamWorks, built up a lot of connections. So then when she was ready to do Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss, of course she was ready to go. And of course she had all of her mm. ducks in a row. Yeah. Um, the Cuphead people, you know, the Moldenhauers that are based in Canada. You know, it's 2D animation capital of the world in Canada right now. You know, and they were doing it for a game for Microsoft. Of course, you know, they're going to be... And they they put their name out there. They went to the trade shows. They did... They got the exposure. They did the right thing. I didn't do that. I didn't know how to do social media. I didn't know how to do promotion. I mean, I and I was afraid to, you know, because I felt that... You know, I felt I was going to be an embarrassment to the family. I would, I legit like fear is a is a hell of a of a, of a dream killer. Like fear will destroy you yeah. nine ways to Sunday. Like if there's an inkling of fear in you, you're done. You got to overcome that so that way you can pursue your goal, um, which you know is the main thing. They were th- they were fearless. They didn't care. You know, Vivian Madrano, she. You know, she tells stories on demonology in hell with very raunchy characters, uh, very intricately designed characters. They're all very written well. Like, she, she's mastered it. She's turned Saturday morning cartoons into something that adults would like, like raunchy adults. She's also integrated a lot of the LGBTQ community. She's, you know, she's really done a lot for inclusion. Which is great, you know. Um, I'm a little bit more conservative, you know. I'm not gonna lie, um, you know. I, uh, you know, there. I I wouldn't even think of doing something like that, you know, five ten years ago. Now it's a different story. Um, there are things that, you know. Your skills, you know, their skills, they were able to evolve them. They were able to fast track them. I was not. I had difficulties. I had boundaries that unfortunately I I succumbed to during that time. So yes, of course I was jealous. And yes, of course I, I like legit hatred for a lot of the success of a lot of these people. Because if they had just gotten like maybe a million, two million like okay well done they were getting hundreds of millions of people and i'm just like okay that's just not fair 
Like, I, but if you look and you go, well, yes, it is fair because their resources were very different than what I have. Even now, I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I'm very blessed. And that's, that's what, you know, to combat it, you go back and you look at your own life and you say, okay, I'm here because I did A, B, and C. I can't go back. I can't undo what I've done before. The only thing I can do right. today is move forward. And I always say, as long as you wake up in the morning and you're still perpendicular to the ground and you're not here, you're, you know, you can keep moving on with your dream. You can keep going. You can, you can make it happen. Um, so, and then I just go for it. You know, yeah. you, you build up the courage to say, if this person can do it, there's no reason I can't do it. There's no reason why Chuck E. Chicken um, stayed in limbo for more than seven years, eight years. And then finally it took a pandemic for me to go, okay, I think I need to get to work on this. <laughs> and um, I mean, it shouldn't have taken that, but it did. You know, I can't look, I can't go back. But now what I, what I, I, I am in control of me and yeah. the team. What I do reflects, you know, whatever the team does, you know, whatever you do, whatever everyone else does. Like as, as the showrunner, that's what I have to do. I have to make sure that you guys know what to do next. If I let jealousy get in my head, which I've done, and as you guys know, when Michael is, you know, to, to a detriment, if Michael isn't feeling up to it, nothing gets done. It sucks. <laughs> you know, it's just why I'm like, okay, I need to find other people who can help me get back out of that funk because I do get into it. Um, but my advice to anybody who deals with jealousy and says, wow, I mean, you know, because I've had, I've had conversations with people that you and I both know very well, you know, saying like, wow, they're, they're 20 years old, they're 23 years old, and look at the success they've already had. It's like, well, number one, when we were... 20, 23, you know, we had parents that loved us and said, get your ass a job, go work, go do what you need to do to pay the bills. You know, it, you know, they instilled that work. At, I'm from the Midwest of, of the United States. You know, I'm in farm country. There is no movie studio. There is no, you know, there's nothing here. You know, especially now where I live in Davenport, Iowa. I'm literally on the banks of the Mississippi River. So for me, it's like, it's always been a struggle. I've lived in LA maybe yeah. three months out of my entire life um, when I was working at Disney. Um, I had wonderful experience when I was out there, nothing that stuck. And there's a reason for it. God had a different plan. And I think that's the, the key. It's like, you're on your own path. You have to make your own decisions and you need to figure out, okay, this is the benchmark. Like, this is where you want to be. Now, instead of getting to just here, how do I get to even here? <laughs> you know? Like, because if I get here, I don't need to beat Vivian Madrano anymore. Because her audience and my audience are two completely different audiences. You know? I'm not trying to get the demon-loving yeah. crowd. I'm trying to get the family crowd. I'm not trying to... Um, you know, gross people out. I'm trying to charm them. Um, and that's what helped. Knowing that her audience is a completely different audience from mine, but I will get stragglers on both ends, you know, because there are people yeah. who love Hasbin Hotel who love Chuck E. Chicken, you know. There are people who love Chuck E. Chicken who are fanatics about Hasbin Hotel. All the way around, too. There are people who love Hasbin, hate Chuck E. Love Chucky, hate has been, you know? They're out there. It's fine. And it's not like it was years and years and years ago where you had to compete for attention, you know? Competition in the field is good, but it's not necessarily necessary anymore because anybody can like anything, you know? That's, that's you know, you're not fighting for subscribers, you know, because it doesn't matter. Like, you can be subscribed to both you know, has been and a Chucky. Kudos to you. You're supporting both of us, you know. And you can buy a Chucky chicken pin or a 
Angel Dust plush. And that's cool. You're supporting both of us. That's, the, that's what I love about the YouTube community and the YouTube medium. And when you figure that out, you feel a lot better about yourself. And you go, okay, I'm not competing with this person. If anything, I am adding another piece of high quality content to this platform for people to enjoy. You know, because at the end of the day, they're not going to look at my work and compare it to Has Been Hotel. They're going to look at my work, how it stands on its own. And if I'm lucky, yeah. if I'm lucky, they will compare it to Has Been Hotel. But that can't be the, the goal. The goal has to be you put your best, and even you. Like if, if, you're, if you get jealous of what somebody is doing or if someone is able to be like this amazing artist, think about all the work that they had to do to get there. Like think of, you, yeah. know, you don't see on the back end how many hours they logged in doing figure drawing or learning how to paint or, you know, you don't see the, the crap artwork. You don't see the rough sketches. You don't see the hundreds and hundreds of hours that these creatives pour into their craft. You just see the result of that. You know, if there, I see 20 year olds you know, who, who have no life like I did when I was 20 years old. They didn't have a good career. You know, they didn't have a good social life, but they became an amazing artist, you know, and they yeah. put their work out there and they were working from 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. And they, you know, instead of going to the sock hops or the dances, they stayed home and they drew or they learned how to code or they learned how to you know, animate. They learned how to do film. They watched film. They studied films. They didn't watch cartoons. They watched Spielberg, Zemeckis, uh, you know, Scorsese. They watched, um, you know, the greats of the film industry. They studied their craft. They're passionate about it. They got the books. They read. The, it's one thing to have the books. It's another thing to crack them open and read them and do the do the work that's required. And so many people today get yeah. jealous because they go, oh, I could do that. Show me. Show me what you can do. And if your work looks yeah. as good as that, cool. Put it out there. Yeah. You know, if it doesn't, and still put it out there anyway. <laughs> do something. Yeah. If you're jealous, pick up a piece of paper. Start typing a story. Start drawing, you know, start making a mold or start, you know, modeling something in 3D if that's your, whatever your, your thing is. If, if you're jealous of somebody else, that is just a reflection of your own insecurities of what yeah. you want to be, but you're not willing to put the work in to get there. There is no such thing as a free ride in our industry. You need to work I hard. What, what I agree with, what I, what I agree with the most, uh, there is uh when you when you said um you know uh just because someone else is uh getting um like subscribers on youtube uh it doesn't doesn't mean that they, they can't also support your work um i think that that's that's a a very good thing to hang on to because i've read about the zero sum game do you know about that no that means uh, it's all it basically means is um, you feel jealous because when someone else is uh, successful, uh, it makes you feel like um, you're, that 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 means that you failed. Uh, that's something that a lot of people apparently. Well, I I know that I'm guilty of that. Uh, and the, and the funny thing is, even after reading about it and saying, yeah, I believe that that makes sense, I found that it still hurts every time. I, I get that feeling of jealousy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that's a good thing to remember because um, the, the people who subscribe to our channel, um, we, we, we're not competing with the other channels. It's just, you know, it, it, it's something that we can all share. And right. um, I, I do agree that's, that's one of the great things about this age. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think... Um, now, can I remember what I was going to say? <laughs> the, I'll give you the perfect example of how jealousy yeah. can kill a career and and can really detriment your uh, your success in our business. Have you ever heard of the Fleischer brothers? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Day, Max and Dave Fleischer, creators of yeah. Betty Boop, brought Popeye the Sailor mm -hmm. to the screen 
innovative animators, invent, inventors of the rotoscope, um, the first sound on film before Disney, a lot of technical innovations before Disney. Max Fleischer hated Walt Disney with a passion. He did everything in his power to beat Walt Disney. He was jealous because here comes this younger guy coming in and his little mouse is beating out Betty Boop and beating out Popeye. And, you know, Walt was getting all the credit. Meanwhile, his animators were, you know, I mean, and there was a lot of, there was a lot of tension, you know, and Walt Disney didn't even know who Max Fleischer was. That's the thing. It's just like, you know, who's this Max Fleischer guy? Why does he hate me so much? Oh, he's jealous of you, Walt. Oh, okay. But what I love about those two men was at the end, of what ended up happening was uh, the Fleischers were working out of Paramount Studios. That's where all the cartoons were made. Um, Paramount loaned them money to build a brand new studio in Miami, Florida. So they moved from New York to Miami. Okay. And unfortunately, there was a argument between Max and Dave that split them up permanently. Like they never reconciled. Paramount came in, saw this fight, saw this feud, also fueled by the jealousy that Walt was experiencing. Like, Walt had just won the Oscar for the first, you know, animated feature film with Snow White. Beat out Popeye the Sailor. It meets Sinbad the Sailor. I mean, Mr. Bug goes to town. Gulliver's Travels. Like, all of those features. You know, they were doing the Superman cartoons. But Paramount stole their company. They took over their company. Ousted the leadership. Ousted the Fleischer Brothers. And they became no names and virtually overnight non-existent. Um, now there's a happy ending to the story in one degree where um, Max's son, Richard Fleischer, ended up directing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for Walt Disney. And, right. and Walt approached Rich and said, listen, um, I want to extend an invite to your father to come to our to my studio and reunite with his artists who are not working for me. And they did. And they had the Inkwell reunion in 1965. And these two very bitter competitors became friends and reconciled. It's the stories you don't hear a whole lot in Hollywood, the really good ones, you know, about yeah. these two, you know, very respectable people that Max Fleischer and Walt Disney were, you know. And whenever Walt went to New York, he paid a... A visit to Max and you know it was just a very it became a good friendship but it was near the end of his life you know but yeah and to make matters even worse Max lost all the credits on his cartoons to Paramount they started sh uh, shipping out to the uh, the uh, American artist uh, you know like AAPA or something like that you know APAA um uh the Association of for Production Artists of America or something like that. And um, they stripped off the credits of Max Fleischer and Dave Fleischer off the cartoons. And Max sued to get the, the credits restored. And just as they were about to basically give him everything that he wanted and more, he passed away. You know? So jealousy can kill you. Literally. Yeah. And it can also destroy your career. And like, you know, so, and that's a hard lesson to learn, Yeah. but it's an important one to learn. And ever since I learned that story, I was like, I don't want to be Max Fleischer. No. I don't want to be jealous for the reason. One of the things that, yeah, I think what I've learned is that, because the, the, the problem is jealousy is kind of a natural thing. We all feel it from time to time. Right. Um, so I think the, uh, what, the way I like to look at it is, Jealousy is a form of inspiration. So uh, if, if, if you have that, like, as I say, I, I almost feel like it hurts when uh, someone makes me feel jealous. Um, but I've realized that that, that is almost like, uh, it, it means that I'm able to pinpoint the exact moment that I'm getting my inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
and that's a very valuable thing because I've heard so many creative people say, like when people ask them, where do they get their inspiration from? They just don't know. Like, right. No idea. Where right. Came from. And even right now, like we're we're doing our Kickstarter for Chucky Chicken. Yeah. We're only we're, you know we're shy of two thousand bucks. You know, at, at the a little uh, over our first week. You know, we got fifty yeah. days left, but we're just shy of two thousand mm. bucks. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing wrong? Like, why why do we not have more? Like, what can I do? To, to better it because I then look at other Kickstarters that have fully funded their projects and yeah. more within mm. like the first week or, you know. Yeah, I know, yeah. And I get a little jealous, but then I go, okay, what did they do that I'm not doing and then fix yeah. it? So that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do right now. Like, for example... So I strongly believe that uh, as long as more and more people become aware of what we're doing, we will get those backers. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And it's... So the, the difficult thing is just, you know... Letting people know. The attention. Yeah. Yeah. Letting them know. yeah. And it's funny because I've had a lot of, you know, of, of, of the bigger influencers on our show, like Johnny and Uncle Al and Mike Pollock and, Tom, you know, Tom Ruger have been, you know, blasting people. And it was so funny because I've... I've gotten plenty of comments from people like, wow, I didn't know this person was involved. Hell yeah, I'm going to donate. Or like, oh my goodness, yeah, let's do this. Like, why have I never heard of this before? It's like, well. I'm, I'm still pinching myself about Tom Ruger. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to say, you know, th th this is true. Uh, when you told us on, on Facebook group that um, Tom had joined the team, mm -hmm. I did not believe you. Oh, really? When I read that, I was like, no, you're, you're having me on. <laughs> There's no way that you got Tom Ruger involved in this project. <laughs> I didn't believe in myself either, to be honest with you. I, um, when I, and that was completely by chance. I, I, yeah. I have, I've had him as a Facebook friend for a while. Mm -hmm. And I put out a post about the Oscars, basically saying something to the effect of, I don't want to be one of those guys who, you know, says, I want to thank my mom who's looking me, looking down at me from heaven. I want my mom to be on the stage with me and I want to hand her the award saying, okay, your job is done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he liked that comment. And so then I reached out to him. I said, hey, I saw that you liked the comment. I'm a big fan. Da, 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 da. And he says, yeah, I'm a fan of yours too. I really like your chicken. And I was wondering if there was an opportunity that you and I could talk. Are you free? And I said, hell yeah, I'm free. Let's do yeah. it. You know, it's like, of course. Um, and he's just been a huge, a big, big help. And he's just been like a, a really, a great advisor of, of, of how to do, because Chuck, like Animaniacs and Tiny Tins is a huge inspiration to how I want to do the Chucky e. Chicken cartoons. Like, I love the music. I mm -hmm. love the animation. Yeah. I love the writing. I love the characters. So why wouldn't you want to do something like that and bring it into modern day? And at the time, you know, it was right before the reboot of Animaniacs came out, which he wasn't invited to be a part of, by the way. Yeah, that's weird. And it shows, you know. Yeah. I mean, but I was, I mean, I'm very blessed in, in that way. I mean, it just, it's amazing how out of great tragedy comes really, really good things. And... Mm -hmm. You know, I was in a rut during that time in my life. I had just, you know, I had gone through a bit of a breakup. I was new in, into my home. You know, I was new in town. I was low on rent. I, you know, there was, a, you know, I wasn't working. The, the pandemic was just raging on. There was just a lot that was going on during that time. And it was really, really difficult. But then to get Tom, you know, to be like, yeah, I'll take a chance on you. I'll take a look and see what you can do. And I'll offer my input. I'll offer my advice. You know, what do you need from me? Da, 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 da. It was just like, thank you, God. <laughs> you know, like, thank you. Yeah. So, and then from him, you know, came Johnny, came Mike, came all the people that we have now working. Yeah. And Brian Finley, of course, who came yeah. before Tom and um, there's it's just been it's been really really amazing to see the you know just uh, I don't want to say that those people brought a lot of the audience that we have but they certainly did help <laughs> you know so and I'm hoping they'll help again so we'll see what happens yeah 
Yeah, I, I just thought um, the funny thing about both Tiny Toons and Animaniacs, I, I remember. I mean, Tiny Toons especially. That was a show that I I loved watching with my brother and sister. Mm -hmm. and my brother and sister are both older than me, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's weird because I think um, may, maybe it's a British thing, but uh, I think the, the way we consume media was just like, uh, yeah, we'll have it on. We we didn't really watch TV shows like uh, even if we loved them, um, we. We, we kind of limited our TV. We were that kind of family, basically. Sure. We just lim limit our TV viewing quite a bit. Um, and I think because when my brother and my sister got older, they, they just, I, I think they just decided they weren't quite as into cartoons as that they were before. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think, truthfully, I, I still love watching cartoons, but it wasn't the same watching them alone. Because my parents didn't want to watch them, and my siblings didn't want to watch them, so now the experience of watching TV just completely changed. Right. And I think, in a way, I kind of had to force myself to um, find other things to do, mm -hmm. um, which, which I feel a bit weird about. I, I have mixed feelings because I never stopped. As I say, I never stopped liking Tiny Toons or Animaniacs, but. Um, I, I I didn't get into them uh, so much because as, as soon as my brother and sister stopped watching them, I, I kind of followed. And um, when I went to, when I went to university, I found myself uh, watching way more cartoons than I did when I was. I, I, I just started sort of making up for all the. the oh yeah. I was I, I hadn't spent watching them. And, and I was like, yeah, because I was just thinking about Tiny Toon Adventures because I remembered it quite clearly, mm -hmm. um, watching it with my siblings. And when I uh, went on YouTube and looked it up, I, I started, I, I realized I appreciated it so much more as an adult. Um, and yeah, the, the, there was just so much that I never got around to seeing. So yeah, it was, it was really mind blowing. and. I think Animaniacs even more so because I almost got into that show, but I think it, it did arrive a bit late. And as I say, it was just around that time that I was watching less cartoons. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I'm excited that we've got Tom Ruger involved because it, it was just because I, I think um, when I was at university, when I was supposed to be studying film and TV, um, I suppose I was studying TV. <laughs> <laughs> you were studying it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in a way I, I was. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I got back into cartooning and uh, that, that was when I started Beluga Tunes. So yeah, I think that, that's the influence that he's had on me. And I kind of wish that uh, I'd, I'd spent more time watching Tiny Toons and Animaniacs. <laughs> you know, it's it's... It's funny you say that because I kind of had the same experience. You know, I watched, I watched them when they were coming out on TV. You know, Animaniacs, Tiny Toons, with my little brother and my little sister. I'm the, I'm the complete opposite. I'm the oldest of the three of us. Oh, you know, so they stopped watching, but I kept watching. You know, mm -hmm. and they would. It was always a struggle because they'd want to watch something different. Then cartoons, yeah. they get mad at me, like, why are we watching Animaniacs? You know, let's put on, uh, you know, uh, uh, the football game. Or, you know, let's watch, uh, you know, something else. Like, why are we watching this, you know, these cartoons? Um, and it, it really, it was difficult in a way because there was really that divide. Uh, yeah. And it, it really, you're, you are right. There is a difference in watching... Even watching like the the classic movies with your family, mm. it's very different to watch them together than it is watching it by yourself. When you're watching it by yourself, it's more for educational purposes. In my, in my, uh, yeah, you know, it's not much entertaining as it is education. But when you're watching it with people, then it becomes the experience that it's meant yeah. to be, you know, and that kind of fuels me 
to make the cartoons that I want to make. Because now I have two nieces who yeah. are like who are, uh, two and a half. And for me, it, it's so funny now because everything that we grew up watching, now they get to watch. And it's funny because they're starting to love the characters that we grew up loving. And thank God I can do the voices of some of our favorite characters because my nieces now call and instead of asking for Uncle Michael, they ask for Mickey Mouse. They ask for Donald Duck. They ask for Goofy. (laughs) And when I do the voices over the phone, they scream with excitement. And that just gives me just like the biggest thrill. It's like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm... I'm doing what I was put on this earth to do for these two little girls. And, you know, I, I got the, you know, I, I bring Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck to family events. And there they are talking with the, the kids. And there's this new generation of us. So in a way, it's cool because it's like I get to do something that is immediately absorbed by little ones yeah. again. Mm-hmm. So, and I become the fam- the favorite uncle. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, Congratulations. Yeah, I'm, I'm tr- yeah, right. Now I'll wait till I turn from uncle to daddy, and then all of a sudden this will be white. Yeah. But you know, um, but no, it, it, and that's you, you're so right on the head with that because there really is a shift. You know, even going to um, the movies by yourself, um, yeah. you feel different than if you're there with somebody that you know. Because yeah. it, it, the experience shifts. There's really a, a change, you know. And um, I, I really hope that what we do, I mean, and, and first off, like, I, I'm thankful that you're working with us. Like, that, that story touches my heart quite a bit. And that makes me feel good because we're doing the right thing, you know. Tom has had this conversation with me where he's like, I don't know why you want me to be involved. You know, I'm in my mid, I'm in my late sixties, you know, I'm over the hill. People don't want the kind of cartoons that I make anymore. I'm like, Oh, I do. You know, yeah. like I, I want Animaniacs the way they used to be. You know, I want to see the cartoons like, and, um, it, he was so cute because he's like, all right, well, if you like him, then I guess there's gotta be an audience for them out, you know, somewhere, but let's make Chucky different. Let's not just redo Animaniacs with a Chucky Chicken skin. Let's make it different. You know, let's make it the yeah. show that Animaniacs yeah. isn't doing. And it's really fun because I get to work with the guy who made my favorite show while it's yeah. being rebooted horribly, I might add. And we both get to tear it apart, which is great. Um, and it's it's really fun. And he, he is a... He is a good mentor. He's not my only mentor, but he is a good mentor. And he is someone that I really, um, I'm very honored to be working with him. So, mm-hmm. and that was completely by just chance and luck and just being ready, you know. It is amazing. Yeah. Right. Um, shall we uh, talk about the Kickstarter? Yes. Just to make it clear, because this is this is a very important thing, we need to we've got to plug this, haven't we? Yes. So, uh, Chucky Chicken is. Oh, we've just gone up. I think. Did we really? I think I think I just saw it go up. Oh my God! How much? Oh. Let me see. Where are we at now? Wait, is that more? I can't remember. Where are we at? What it was before. We are currently at uh, one thousand eight hundred and fourteen dollars. Oh, uh, well, maybe up from what you is saw. That, less than... that that no, that's that's. <laughs> That's where we were yesterday, but yeah. So, okay. um, but no. Um, I thought it was updating. It? Yes, oh, I know, right? Um, so yes, we do have the Chucky e. Chicken Kickstarter. It is live now through June thirtieth at twelve o'clock noon Central Standard Time. Um, we have a lot of great perks. We got a lot of great donations. Um, we're looking to get twenty five thousand bucks to do a full fledged seven minute pilot short. And um, again, all that money will go to paying the artists, to paying the animators, to paying everybody on the team, and to establish the the Chucky e. Chicken troupe, if you will, and um, and to get us really going and making cartoons, so that we can continue to do this and that we can make it a career. Like that's that's the goal. Um, so yeah, yeah, if if you're a fan of classic animation, if you want to see something that's not a 
a reboot of a pre-existing property. Um, if you love, you know, class, you know, if you want to see a good cartoon that you can share with a general audience, this is, you know, definitely the, the Kickstarter for you. We got everything from like yep. pins and, um, you know, buttons, you know, all the way up to you can be a part of our show, which is yeah. really, really cool. How cool is that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're at eighteen hundred bucks, eighteen fourteen right now. So my goal was to hopefully break, to, you know, two thousand, which we did. But then we <laughs> had a thousand dollar donator. Unfortunately, you know, uh, he couldn't commit, and that's okay. It happens. But, um, but I'm excited about it. Like, share it with all your yeah, friends. Really. If you can't donate it, you know, share it with people who you know can. Yeah. So. Yeah, help, help us. Please, 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 please. <laughs> please help us. <laughs> so, and then, and, and, you know, if we get more, then we'll be able to do more. So help us, yeah. you know, make this a reality. Okay, so that, yeah, we've reached the end of my, my list, so. Oh, hey, <laughs> fair enough. So, I mean, they, thank you for having me. Like, this has been, I, I, yeah, I, I love, you. yeah, like, this is the first interview that I've done since, launching the kickstarter so this is really interesting i'm, I'm hoping that it mm -hmm. does well yeah and me too yeah I, i'm so happy to i, I said that I, I, it, it is a dream come true for me just to be in the part of this team it's a dream yeah, to have you here just, too yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah and thanks very much for doing this interview thanks thanks michael well thank you for having me man this is i'm i'm honored and humbled so thank yeah. you i mean my my story's not that interesting to me but to other people like that's <laughs> well this has been a very interesting conversation i didn't realize we were going to talk about disneyland i think that... <laughs> when you you know whenever you talk to me disney has to pop up somehow in the conversation you know yeah, good. <laughs> and, and yeah we just because i yeah, I, I I am a bit of a shy, quiet person. So no, uh, you I, shy? <laughs> are you kidding I, me? Uh, <laughs> You're the extrovert around me. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> I, I was just I was just gonna say because uh, before we started, I was just a bit nervous because mm -hmm. I I didn't know if we would be able to talk about that much, and I'm just glad that uh, we managed to have a really good lengthy conversation oh yeah man you know especially when you're talking amongst friends like I, th that's the cool thing about this is like i've known you for a, a, a while now and it, it's funny because even though addy is gone and not a lot not a, attached to the project anymore you're still here you know which to me is yeah. like very very cool um and i wish you all the best i i, I know that we kind of parted based off of a disagreement but um, you know, I hope that she continues to do good with her art and, you know, she, she's plugging away. She's expecting her first baby pretty soon, which is exciting. Oh, right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I wish her all the, the luck in the world and I hope everything goes well with that. But, but no, man, I, I'm very blessed to have you on the team. You are an asset. You are someone that people just look at your work and go like Brian raves you know, raves and raves and raves about you. Like he is just, oh, that's great. you know, he, he's so proud of you. He's like, God, I love working with, <laughs> with Andrew because he just, he wants to learn and oh. he wants to get better and he is getting way better. And he is just an excellent find. And, um, like your, your scene that you did with an upcoming, uh, short, uh, carolers of clucking, which, uh, which will be out. This Christmas, yep. we're gonna make that happen this year. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna elongate it and make it better, but it will be out this year. Um, you know, we um, y you've grown quite a bit, and we're we're all very proud. Like I'm proud of you. Like I I've seen your work and I've seen what you've been able to do, and your leaps and bounds Thank better you. than when you started. So, and you were pretty good then too. <laughs> so, yeah. That it's very flattering to hear that. Um, yeah, um, I, I had a great time because I, um, I'm looking forward to doing more work with Brian, hopefully, because um, mm -hmm. he taught me a lot. And also, because I think both of you, you you're just really great at um, teaching people like me new things, uh, but also being really encouraging. Well, sure. 
Because, I mean... Th- and I think we can end... <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. That seemed like a nice place to end. Yes! <laughs> nice end. Well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to wrap this up, because that's the bit that I'm finding. You got an outro? <laughs> you got anything you want to play? Or... <laughs> play me off. <laughs> there you go. So, thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for... Well, I mean that, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was going, yeah, I was saying I mean that. And yeah, uh, thank you very much. My pleasure, my friend. Thank you for having me. So now get to work. We got a cartoon to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So thank you, folks. Support the Kickstarter. Support this guy, Beluga Tunes. If you like yep. what you saw, please subscribe. Um, leave your like, comments down below, everything. And we will see you next time. Yeah, so that was my interview with Michael Cook. I hope you enjoyed it. He's a really positive guy, isn't he? And uh, I just, uh, I think it it was just so good to hear all of that Um, because, you know, he he gave some really great advice. uh, And yeah, just, I I feel like everything in that conversation was just so positive, you know, and uh, it's exciting that um, we're doing this. And yeah, so uh, I was really happy to be able to do that and to share it with all of you. So yeah, uh, once again, please help us out. Um, and it's, uh, I'm going I'm to try and remember to put a link to the Kickstarter uh, in, in the description for this video. Uh, and I want to encourage people to to back that and to let all your friends know about it. And because yeah, I, I really think this is worth it. I think this this is something that matters. <laughs> so yeah, um, and yeah, so there you go. That that's that's it. That's my podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Do take care. And I am off to the pub.